Hi, this is a this is going to be a pretty geeky walkthrough, technical walkthrough of the architecture of Rome Inter. So, if you are just interested in using Rome Inter as an end user, this is probably going into far too much detail for you. But if you're interested in helping to further develop Rome Inter, or you would like to take some of the ideas and use in your own projects, uh, hopefully this will be helpful. So I wanted to start with uh, an invitation and to give a little bit of um, background to how this came to be and what I'm envisaging for the future. Um, I started writing up this concept about two weeks ago and uh, the initial, I'm going to publish this page here that I'm using. So there's a link to the initial concept note. Um, this was basically me having a pretty concrete idea of how you could do uh, multiplayer in user land, so using Rome slash JS and not any new core functionality in Rome, um, based on libraries uh, and patterns that I worked with before. So I wrote this up, I shared it, and I actually haven't edited this at all after I started implementing, so some of the things I ended up doing differently or I ended up not yet implementing, but this is a good kind of background read and it has some links as well. And what's the current status of Rome Inter? Well, it is fully functional in the way that it does work. Um, the videos uh, that I shared are, have not been edited. Uh, there's no trickery. Um, this uh, actually does work. Um, however, uh, there were a lot of corners cut um, because I basically knew that I did not have the capacity to bring this to a, a fully kind of product um, polished state by myself. And I wanted to see if I could uh, interest the community. And so I first wrote of this concept note. And to me, it was already very clear that this was completely doable. Um, but that was based on all the experience and knowledge I have working with these libraries and patterns. And I think it, the concept note did not uh, gather a lot of interest. Um, it was too abstract, perhaps. And so I gave myself a certain amount of time to really kind of push through and get to a functional demo that would hopefully um, demonstrate both the possibility and also hopefully open the eyes to some of the um, consequences if we had this kind of technology. And um, my hope is that other people want to help collaborate on this, both in design decisions, uh, there are still th some things to be decided, and in actually um, making this into something that's super solid and that everyone could install if they want to and, and start publishing and start building upon, uh, because these are also thought of as kind of new types of core abstractions, just like we have blocks, child blocks, block references, um, linked references, you know, Rome is... Um, has these kind of Lego blocks that are can be recombined in many different ways. And I'm hoping that these um, streams could be a new kind of core abstraction. So um, I am hoping that people will reach out and, and want to continue to develop this. And if not, I will not um, bring this to publish a kind of a, a complete state by myself. I just don't have the capacity given um, other commitments. So, uh, you know, this is an open invitation and that's why I'm also doing this video and trying to share a lot of um, detail about how, what's going on. So yeah, in this uh, document, which I'm going to share the URL to, you'll find the, the Twitter thread um, where I made the announcement and I kind of live tweeted some of my development. You'll find some of the videos uh, that I did and a link to the code and also how to deploy that code. Um, I'm doing this uh, technical walkthrough. And as I said, it is really up to the community. I'm releasing all this as open source. Um, one way forwards is for people to gather together and say, we want to build Rome Inter. Let's discuss the design. Let's um, hack on the code. Um, let's try things out. Another approach is for someone to say, I want to build something else. It's not Rome Inter. Um, it looks differently. It has a different name. I want to use some of these concepts or some of this code. Um, you're absolutely welcome to do so. And uh, I just, I want this for myself because <laughs> a lot of the things I build, it's uh, scratching my own itch. 
and I would also love to see, um, you know, people just pushing the boundaries. Um, so that is the prelude. Now, what is this thing actually? How does it work? So I started, um, a lot of my thinking comes from this library called ShareDB. And it's a really wonderful library, uh, JavaScript library, that I have actually been working with um, for many years, um, about five years. In my previous um, research uh, position and in the current uh, job that I have at Minerva, we also use ShareDB very heavily. Uh, there is, so I actually recorded a video um, that was part of my interview, the interview process uh, to my current job, where I talk about how ShareDB works and how operational transforms work. So ShareDB is a library to let people synchronously collaborate on editing. And if you think about um, typing text, for example, uh, because there's always some delay on the internet, um, if you have two people editing the same string, and someone types something and someone else makes a delete, um, what can happen is that uh, the, if you delete the, try to delete A, but I already typed B, then your delete comes after my insert, and then suddenly you're deleting the B instead of the A. And so I'm not gonna go through my whole video here, but it's, it's basically a way of um, defining these atomic updates uh, to different data types, and it could be a string data type, but very importantly, it could also be a JSON data type, which can have a tree structure. And so you can insert um, an object, you can, um, a node, you can update an object, you can have a list where you insert, you move. Um, so you're kind of, instead of describing the new end state, you're describing your intention. And then there are these um, algorithms that uh, are able to merge different updates um, and transpose them in the way that it, to the largest extent possible, preserves the intention of each user. Um, and it also, so it has these algorithms, but then the way it works is through WebSockets, which is the same mechanism that Rome uses to communicate with its backend. So you basically connect to a ShareDB server, and once you're connected, you can uh, create or subscribe to different documents and then you can uh, have different data types within these documents and you can um, create uh, these uh, changes um, on these documents and you can subscribe to updates. And you can also read, of course, the current state of the whole document. Uh, and I've, as I said, I've used this a lot. I'm actually for the demo just using a ShareDB server that um, <laughs> is there for another purpose. Um, it's very, very easy to set up a ShareDB server. So, uh, the initial idea I had is, is to say that the operations you could do on a JSON structure in ShareDB seem to kind of mirror the kind of updates you could do to a Rome um, tree. So when I say tree, I mean any block and all of its children, right? And that block could be a top level block, it could be a whole page, or it could be far down in the hierarchy, but it's kind of the part of the, the, the Rome database or the Rome graph that we were interested in uh, watching. So, um, that's how I started thinking about this. Um, and we'll get back a little bit to how we're operating with ShareDB. Now, the next step was right now, there are two kinds of um, Rome APIs, uh, one for read and one for write, and they're actually incredibly different. Um, the read API is based on data log queries and which can be very powerful. And although they're a little bit hard to wrap your head around, but luckily there are people in the community who have done a really good job of documenting that. So you can write a query that uh, recursively gets a block and all of its children uh, with any kind of metadata that you want created by um, created date, uh, string content, uh, parents, and so on. So in a single query, you can actually grab any, um, any subtree um, from the Rome database. However, if you wanted to insert a tree of blocks, um, there is no um, kind of uh, corresponding write API. The write API is much more atomic and it works at the block level. So you can insert a block, you can um, update the contents of a block, like typically the string contents, or you can uh, move a block 
And if you move a block, you will move, of course, all of the children blocks because blocks have, have parents and children. Um, so what I was trying to do is to kind of abstract over these two APIs and say, I want to be able to read a, to pick any, any node in the, in, the, in the database and get it, the node and all of its the children in a JSON structure and then be able to insert that entire subtree anywhere else in the graph. Um, and I also want to be able to do transformations on that subtree. Um, so for example, if I have two subtrees, then I want to be able to do a diff, a difference on those two. Uh, and ideally, I would be able to calculate the minimal amount of updates in the graph that are required to turn one subtree into another. Um, and, you know, the, the, a simple use case for this would be um, you have a, a state in the graph, I save it, and now you make a bunch of edits, and I capture this new state, and I want to see what are the changes. So let's say that I wrote this earlier state into another database, and now you have made some changes. I want to write those new changes into the new graph, and what are the, what's the minimal amount of changes I need to make to make that new graph um, up to date? And this is kind of a classical computer science, you know, interview question almost. Um, and I figured there would be a, kind of an existing library or, or a good algorithm for doing this. And I went down a little bit of a, a rabbit hole um, and I, I didn't quite find exactly what I was looking for. Um, and there, there's a lot of different kind of sorting algorithms and diffing algorithms and they have different cost functions and also the, the idea of the... Uh, the nodes in um, in Rome they have all these different metadata, but the UID is is you know has a specific significance um, because you can update the string of a node, but you can't update its UID. I mean, um, and and when you insert a node, you um, insert it at a specific order, and that will of course increment the order of all the subsequent nodes. So, it turns out calculating all of this is is slightly tricky. I think, uh, so I, I tried doing that. I think I got a fair amount of the way. I didn't get to the end. And I think this would be something hugely beneficial for the community. So I hope that regardless of anything else that uh, we as a community can build really um, powerful tools around this. The advantage is that you can do all of the development outside of Rome because this is just about manipulating data structures. And so you can um, sit just using Node and rerunning tests or uh, other things to develop these algorithms. But um, I basically, what I do have is I have a, a function that can read any, um, that you can just point at the UID and it will, it will generate the JSON, uh, a nested uh, tree structure JSON with all of the children blocks. And I have another API or another function that can um, take that JSON structure and insert it into any node uh, as a child of any node in the graph. So that works well. Um, then, so what I'm doing for diffing right now is actually very simple. It's much simpler than what I was hoping to get. I'm right now looking only for inserts, so new blocks added, and um, updates, so any existing blocks that had a change in the string content. Um, and so if you, if you take a bunch of blocks and you drag them to another location, for example, um, I'm not going to deal well with that right now. Um, so, so that's... Uh, part of this. The other part actually is um, how to listen for changes. And right now I'm doing this in an incredibly inefficient way. And it still somehow works, um, which is amazing, but it makes me unhappy. Um, the way I'm doing it is basically using set interval, which runs some JavaScript code at a, at a regular uh, interval. And um, to get this responsive for demos, I'm setting that quite low at maybe 500 milliseconds. Um, and then I execute a data log query against the Rome Alpha API every interval. And in fact, <laughs> I do it even worse than that because instead of having a single kind of a pulse that would just have a list of different functions that need to be run regularly, I have an individual interval for every single subscription. So this is incredibly inefficient and it's one of the first things I would I would fix if this was to go into production. Um, I'm not sure what is the best way, but I think this is where other um, Rome.js plugin makers um, have much better patterns. 
Um, basically, I have two things where I need to look for changes. The first is whenever you type in, um, whenever you type in, uh, you know, subscribe or publish or join conversation, uh, we need to detect that there's a new publication. Or whether you, when you delete it, we actually want to stop listening to that publication or that subscription. So, we, and and that's using attributes. Uh, so it's a, a pretty cheap operation because we're just searching for the linked reference. But still, it you know it would be better if we could um, could do that. And I'm thinking maybe we can use a mutation observer, but I haven't really looked into even how those work um, because these changes would only ever happen when you're on that page, when you're actually looking at that node, when you're making that action. So uh, we could probably do that much cheaper. Um, Ideally, I think in the future, it would be great for the Roam um, API to let you subscribe to changes to linked references or to certain blocks, um, but that doesn't exist yet. So this is the first thing um, that we should improve. Okay, so right now I've told you that we're basically listening to use of these specific attributes uh, to trigger a new publishing, a new subscription, or a new conversation. And we're also listening to these, the things we published to, uh, to see if they change. And we are using these wrappers to read a tree of, a uh, subtree of, of blocks and children. Um, and we're using some simple algorithm to provide a diff uh, to see what has been added, what has been deleted and so on. Now, what, how does this actually kind of work in terms of the subscriptions and publishing though. So what happens if you um, publish something, right? Right now, the initially I had thought of representing a subtree that is the kind of the content of a, pub, of a publishing stream as a single sharedb document. And then all of the operations on that subtree would be represented as sharedb operations. Um, and I think, I still think that's really interesting to explore, but when I was actually trying this out, I started by not using shared DB at all, but rather trying to just have one block in a single graph, um, the changes in one block be automatically synchronized in another block. And so I implemented a very simple mechanism, which is basically a change feed. So you have a, you have an array and a global variable, a window variable. And every time there's a change, you just push to that array and every change has a type. Um, right now, there are only three kinds of changes. There's instantiate, which is setting up a new publishing and which has the full contents of that stream at the beginning, at kind of time zero. Uh, there's update, which updates a single block, typically changing the string contents of a single block. And create, which creates a single new block with uh, a position and a, an apparent UID. So uh, each change also has the name of, of the publishing stream that it belongs to. So there's a single change stream for the entire, um, for the entire, for everything, right? And what happens, uh, and there's a, there's a global address space. So a, 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 publish, a publication has a string name and we match against that. And in the future, what I was thinking is that we could automatically prepend the database name so that if you have a database, a Rome database, because Rome database names are globally unique. So if you have a Rome database uh, name called Stian, like myself for my private graph, uh, and I published a newsletter, it would be Stian slash, um, you know, whatever newsletter. And that way you would guarantee that these names are unique. Um, now, what happens once you publish a stream? So once it detects uh, a new kind of publish colon colon attribute, it uh, grabs the name, of course. Um, it has the UID of that block. And so it knows that all the children blocks are gonna be the contents of that stream. The first thing it does, it reads all those children blocks. It's, it creates a new change um, with a type instantiate with the current contents of the child blocks and the name of the publishing. And then it starts again with this inefficient mechanism um, using set interval to regularly um, pull all the children blocks of that parent block and diff it with the previous state that it keeps in memory 
and then it sees whatever new blocks have been uh, added or modified, and then it generates um, atomic changes for every single block. So, um, and it just puts it on the change feed, and that's all it does. Um, what happens when you subscribe to a stream? So again, we detect the subscription by looking at the, the attribute subscribe, and then we find the, the title of the stream from, from the, the attribute value. And we use that block UID as the target for all of the content that we're going to write. Um, the first thing we do is we the, the subscription um, function for that specific subscription goes through the entire change feed and looks for any changes related to that publication. And of course, the first change will typically be instantiate. So it will write a number of blocks. Um, and then it will just go through and kind of reproduce all of the changes, even though they've happened uh, a while back. Um, now, he, there are lots of ways of, of optimizing this in the future. One way, one thing is that right now we have a global change feed, which is actually incredibly inefficient because you can imagine you have tens of thousands of changes um, or hundreds of thousands. And the obvious thing to do here is to have a separate document per publication and to only subscribe to the um, publication that, that you're interested in because a single um, shared DB WebSocket can have multiple, many, many, uh, you can subscribe to many, many different publications. And then you will also only be pinged when those publications receive updates uh, or those streams. So that's an obvious, uh, and I've, I've worked with systems where you have a shared DB database with like millions of different documents without any problem. So that's an obvious um, change. But anyway, it goes through the change feed uh, and it enacts all of those changes into the graph. And at the end, it keeps a, a track of the index because this is a list. So let's say the last change uh, right now is 50. The, the length of the change feed is 50. And so it will keep track of the last change that it has seen. And then the next time it wakes up, and as I said, currently it just wakes up every... <laughs> 500 milliseconds. Uh, in the future, ideally, it will wake up only when there is a new change. But when it wakes up, it goes through the change feed again, and it sees whether the change feed is longer. And if it's longer than 50, if it's just 50, it will go back to sleep. If it's longer than 50, it will just process those new changes um, and, and, and then kind of up, update whatever needs to be updated, right? Yeah. So that's the really simple basics. But then there are some extensions to this. And one of the things that I'm really kind of proud of um, is the way we deal with um, block references. So, you know, because block references are a really core part of Rome, and it's one of the things that makes this much more powerful than any kind of just normal chat system. Um, now, because the obvious comparison to this approach is to use multiple users in the same room, like we do for the Rome book clubs. And so already with this approach, I have the advantage that this whole conversation, um, and we haven't even gotten to conversations, but let's say this whole stream is in my database. So of course, all the incoming blocks, if I'm subscribing to something, I can now query them, I can search them, I can block reference them. They're part of my knowledge database. So that's already an advantage, right? But, uh, but that's the same advantage you have when you import like Twitter feeds and stuff. Um, what makes this really rich is that you can publish, but you can also bring in any of the other content in your graph and easily share that with others. And the way I do that is that when we're publishing, um, we're going through all of the blocks, all the strings that we're publishing, and we check for any references using these double um, brackets. And luckily that's the same syntax as in an embed. So we, it also catches embeds. Um, we could also look for page links. Um, we don't do that currently. That would be fairly easy to implement, but there are some reasons why we might not want to do that. Um, so that's you know something that could be discussed. But anyway, every time we see a reference, we check whether that reference is to something else in the current stream. And if so, we don't need to do much about it because then that reference has also been published. If it's a reference to a block that's not part of this publishing stream, what we do 
is first of all we add that uh, and and whether if we haven't seen this reference before we add the uid to a field called external references um, because the subscription function only gets one block at a time after the instantiate it doesn't actually see the whole document um, it only gets changes to one block so it doesn't know when it sees a block reference whether that block reference is to something else that it has already received or it is um, to an external block so we we tell it that explicitly and so we put the uid there and then we start a new subscription um, pointed at that block which is being um, published uh, which is sorry which is being block referenced and we could here distinguish between embeds and block references we don't do that and so um, even if you block where and you know this could be changed if we want to but right now even if you just block reference a single block it will also publish all of the ch child blocks and in fact again something we could change but because this uh, block reference and all of the child blocks are now published as a normal stream the same mechanism applies to it so if a if the contents of a block reference or any of the children contains another block reference then that will be iteratively published um, and so that guarantees that all of the all of the content resolves but of course that could be uh, a privacy thing <laughs> if you don't know that something is block referencing something else so that's something that could be easily um, configurable either way we have now these this new publication um, and and the name is just the db name and and the, the uid and what happens then for the subscription is that it will apply the change and it will see oh there's a new external reference it also keeps track of the external references that it has seen but it says hey here's a new external reference i haven't seen it before i'm going to now uh, set up a new subscription where am i going to subscribe to that though what i do is i just basically have a page called rome slash inter slash depot and, and i'll create it if it doesn't exist and on that page i'll just insert a new node with the with the uid and i'll point the subscription there and so nobody's going to want to go to Rome inter slash depot and see all this kind of jumbled child blocks. But because of the way Rome works and because of the UIDs, which we're getting to soon, um, this will resolve beautifully. So when you're looking in the actual conversation or stream, you'll see the content um, in line there. And it turns out this works well. For UIDs, um, this is... You know, it feels like an emerging topic uh, because the write API is pretty new. Um, it is surprising to me that when you write a block, uh, the API doesn't return the UID of that block. So the only easy way for you to know the UID of a block, which is needed for a lot of things, is to generate your own UID. There is another way, which is to write a block and then use some kind of query to look up that block. It seems very inefficient, but it's of course doable. It could be wrapped in an API. Um, in the meantime, the way I'm doing this, and I will do that until I receive guidance that this is um, not a good idea, um, for blocks that um, I'm creating from scratch that don't have a counterpart anywhere, I use a library called uh, CUID, CUID, to generate UUIDs. And these are longer than Roam um, UIDs. And I've used this in, in a previous project where we generated millions of UIDs and I, I trust that library. Um, they are longer, as I said. For most of the blocks though, they are blocks that are coming from another system. Now, if we assume that the UID generation is unique across the global address space, then we wouldn't have to actually do anything about these UIDs. Um, and may, I, I'm not sure if that's a good, um, because I don't know exactly the mechanism that they're using. Uh, they are kind of short, so I, I would worry about that. Instead, what I'm doing is I'm prepending the database name of the sender. So if I have a database called Stian and I'm publishing a stream, then all of the blocks will have a UID Stian slash and then the UID. This uh, basically... Um, 
guarantees that there will never be a conflict as long as you don't subscribe to a stream twice in your database and that's actually not possible right now. I mean, that could be implemented if you prepended something else as well, but um, I'm not supporting that right now. So what I'm doing is, first of all, I'm updating all of the UIDs like this. I'm also going in and looking at all the block references and I'm updating those as well. And finally, um, if I see a block reference that has my database name in it. So I'm Stian, I'm subscribing to a stream and I see a block reference to Stian slash something, then I'm gonna remove the Stian because I want that to resolve to a block in my database. And what this does is it keeps the references between blocks consistent. And it means that if I, for example, publish two different streams that didn't know about it, each other at all, and I referenced uh, blocks uh, from one stream in another stream, those references would resolve in your database and give you um, these really nice uh, back references and so on. Um, and it also means that we can reference stuff from each other's uh, streams. And this is very cool for conversations. So um, we'll get to how the conversations work, but they're basically just pub uh, streams uh, and subs publish publications and subscriptions that don't know anything about each other. And yet if, if you say something and I block reference that, then that will both resolve in my database, but will also resolve in your database when you receive my reply. So this is um, pretty neat. So conversations, right? The way I built conversations, and to me, this is a really cool example of how these um, streams can be thought of as building blocks um, as primitives that we could build all kinds of functionality on top of because the actual, I think it took me like an hour or two and very few lines of code to add the conversations once I had everything else working. It, it was, it's a very, very thin layer. And I think there's many other kinds of things that we could add as well. Uh, what happens is if you type the conversation and it, again, it looks for the attribute, uh, it finds the string, it says, okay, there's a new conversation, I have a UID, everything below it, but there's nothing below it, right? What it will do, it will start it, it will add a change to the database saying, I'm gonna join this conversation. And then it's going to look through the database for any changes um, to that conversation, and it'll subscribe to the conversation. And the only changes that conversation is gonna have is, is, is the join messages and it'll have the database name of each database that joins. And when it finds my join message, it's gonna insert underneath the, 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 the conversation bullet as a child, my database name and the text type here, because that is only, that's the only place where I'm supposed to type. Then, and it will start a publishing stream based on that bullet, so the child bullet that is focused on my database, and it will call that conversation name plus database name. So, you know, let's say settlecasten slash Dian, right? It will start publishing whatever I write. And anyone could actually subscribe to that using just a normal subscribe functionality if they wanted to. Um, but in addition, uh, if they find any other join messages, it will add another bullet under the top conversation level, and it will start a subscription pointed at that child bullet and using again the stream plus a db name so if if, if um you know um tiago joins my conversation um that'll pop up and i will say okay add a child bullet called tiago and um start a subscription under that child bullet um for settle cost and slash tiago and that's really all there is to it uh, everything else around block references and uh, updates and, and stuff is handled by the mechanisms that i have already described Um, so I talked a little bit about ShareDB. Um, basically, we started with this list of changes. And right now, because that seemed to work so well and because I was trying to get to a um, demo, we are still just using ShareDB and in an incredibly simplistic fashion. Uh, we have a single global document, which again is incredibly inefficient, but for the purposes. And we just have a single list of changes that just keeps growing. Um, there are many, so the first obvious change would be to have one document per stream or publication. Um, the other change would be to maybe store the data very differently. Um, 
but the advantage of this was that I was able to go from doing this inside the graph to doing this across graphs with almost no code change. Um, there are some, you know, if we want to actually put this into production, there are some discussions. Uh, currently, there's no access control on the ShareDB server. So even though I could put in my JavaScript that you can only publish a stream with your DB name in front, um, anyone could connect to the ShareDB server and publish anything using other JavaScript, right? It's a very easily, it's a very easy API, it's well understood. Um, so it is possible to implement different kinds of access control or write control on the database, on the, on the ShareDB server, but that adds a lot of complexity um, because now you need to have like concept of users and authentication and stuff. So it's certainly doable, but um, I think probably the starting point would be to say that we only publish kind of global, you know, um, public conversations and we kind of trust each other, at least until we get this thing more tested out. Um, there's also a concern about capacity because ShareDB um, is a WebSocket, which works very different from a normal, you know, when you fetch um, a website or a JavaScript um, library. A WebSocket uh, is open the entire time that you, well, you can open it, you can close it, but by default, uh, it's open. Uh, throughout the, the, the duration. Um, so every time your Rome research basically is, is active and you have an internet connection, it has a shared DB, uh, sorry, it has a WebSocket connection to uh, Firebase, which is what Rome research is using. And by default, right now, whenever Rome Inter is active, it sets up a shared DB connection uh, and that will be active for the duration. Um, and the other thing here is that most people have Rome Research open 24-7, um, whereas like other things, like playing a game or something, you might do that for an hour. So a single super, super cheap uh, server can handle perhaps 50 concurrent users, uh, maybe a bit more depending on how many updates they make and uh, the latency that's acceptable, but that's not a huge number. Uh, you can network servers, and so even for something as low as $40, $50 a month, you could have eight servers um, with one Redis DB, uh, sorry, Redis uh, coordinating and one MongoDB for permanent storage. And so you could serve probably you know, a few hundred uh, up to a thousand concurrent users. Once you get beyond that, it becomes a little bit more complicated and I don't have a lot of experience with it. Um, so again, for just trying this out in a smaller community, that's not an immediate concern. But if we're thinking about this as being something that a huge amount of people might want to use, um, it's it's worth thinking about. Now, you know, there are different use cases for this. If uh, I could see myself, for example, I would love to be able to subscribe to the to the Roam changelog and just have that appear on my daily pages whenever there's an update, or I would love to be able to sh subscribe to people's newsletters. And for that kind of stuff, you really don't need a permanent connection. I mean, you could imagine the thing sh checking in once every 10 minutes, and that would be more than enough and at that point, you could you could support a much, much larger number of users. Um, but then when you're actually doing kind of almost a synchronous chat with someone, um, maybe there's even a mode where you like enable it for a, smart, for a period of time or I don't know. I haven't thought this through deeply, but I wanted to, to bring it up. Uh, nothing is for free on the Internet, even though it is much cheaper than it used to be. Um, and just a final consideration I wanted to mention. Um, Right now, I'm obviously modeling this as a way of communicating between different Rome databases. And I'm looking at, you know, I'm, well, the only really special, I mean, the, the, the basically the, the things I'm assuming is that you have a hierarchy of bullets um, and that you have this with unique IDs um, that can be updated and uh, this concept of block references. So, one thing that this system enables, because it isn't built on the Atomic or the Rome backend, is actually potentially talking to other systems. Um, you could imagine writing a plugin for Obsidian or Remnote or any of these other systems. Um, as long as that API has the ability to read or, you know, or write or both <laughs> uh, to that system, uh, you could imagine doing some kind of translation um, where uh, given that you can copy and paste something from from 
ROM research to um, you know, work flowy. Uh, there's no reason why you couldn't take some bullets and insert them in work flowy or read some bullet from work flowy and, and, and publish those and then insert them in ROM research. Uh, you could imagine dealing, you know, obviously there are different capabilities. So if you publish a bunch of like Kanban boards, they won't be rendered very nicely in RemNote. Um, not, not much you can do about that. Um, if you are dealing with systems that don't support like indented bullets or, or block IDs, you could imagine having like a translation layer that even takes like a, a bullet list from a Google Doc and kind of assigns a fake UID to each bullet and then even does some heuristic to detect when, you know, when is it a move and when is it like a deletion and an insertion or an edit or these, I mean, there are algorithms for this, right? So, so the one exciting possibility here is actually to have um, to have inter-system uh, communication. Another possibility is also to use this as a bridge to different APIs. So imagine that you could um, publish a, so create a, 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 a publish a stream from a Twitter, um, let's say a, a Twitter search or a, a single uh, tweet and, and it's sub tweets, right? Right now I use a, a plugin to, to grab a Twitter thread, but I often like think, oh man, like if there are really interesting responses to this, I'm not gonna come back and like recapture it. It's basically static in my database. But if instead I could just say, hey, here's an interesting tweet. I just wanna subscribe to that tweet. You could imagine um, having registered um, kind of uh, prefixes like Twitter, and if you did a subscription to Twitter slash tweet ID, it would ping some kind of a Twitter bot and say, you know, start following this tweet and, and create a publication based on all the children tw child tweets. And then anyone could subscribe to that. And that would actually be really easy code to write. And the code would have nothing to do with Rome at all. It would just be some JavaScript and, and you know, using the shared DB library. And the same thing for subscribing to any RSS feed, um, subscribing to you know Wikipedia pages, GitHub issues, um, even potentially, although they're privacy issues, you know, I want to subscribe to my I know, smartwatch or to do is. So this could be a really interesting um, universal layer um, for APIs so that you didn't wouldn't have to have the right now, like every Twitter API has to like write their own code for how to in, to to integrate with your own graph. And if you combine this with what I was saying above uh, about connecting to different systems, you could potentially have a really polished um, Twitter bot that you know the community really gave a lot of love to that could be used by both Obsidian and um, Rome Research and Athens and, and whatever. Um, so that, that's kind of an exciting uh, possibility, I think. So that's the basics that I wanted to talk through. Um, I just will quickly show how it works. Um, and then I think I'm, I'm done for now. I'll, maybe that'll be, I'll be happy to answer questions in the future. So here is a database. This is dn-research. This is my public uh, Rome. And I'm going to open the console. And uh, there's a lot of fun stuff here because I think I have some some subscriptions. Let's see. Let me try to just filter this, these ones out. These are probably uh, failed subscriptions that I didn't, didn't deal with very well. So now I'm going to start uh, Rome Inter. And that is going to And if we go into, okay, let's see here. If we go into the network tab and we click, so we can look at all here, but we can look at web sockets. For, we see some fire script and this is all Rome uh, doing its thing. It's kind of fun to look at what, what the Rome is sending back and forth. But then we have this ShareDB subscription. And so it connects to ShareDB and then it subscribes right now to a single document, which is Rome Inter 4. Um, and then it gets back data. And right now it gets back 88 changes. Actually, it's uh, it's more, it's like 100, 113 changes. 
So this is, as I said, implemented as a simple list. And then what happens is that you do operations. And right now the operation we do is we insert at the end of this list, a change. Uh, so I don't know what we're inserting here. Uh, here we're inserting join conversation, uh, which conversation, Rome, and which database names the end idea, right? And then it acknowledges that, or we say, hey, I'm gonna insert um, instantiate, and then this is actually the end idea part of that conversation. Uh, and then it also uh, re receives changes. So here it receives a change where someone else is um, publishing something. So that's the shared DB part. And we can also look at, um, I do I do put a bunch of stuff on the, on the global namespace because it's kind of easier to deal with. So I can do shared DB doc and um, data. And that will always have the, the updated data from shared DB. Uh, I can also look at the, the currently active subscriptions. So there's no subscriptions, there's no publications, right? So let's just try this. If I now do, I'll just go to the test page. No, I didn't want that one because that's, that has a lot of weird stuff. Yes, I want, let's see. Okay, so if I want to create a publication, Let's see what happens. So, so I'll now turn it on by turning this into an attribute. And now let's look at inter pubs and we see that we have a new subscription. Hello from Oslo. This has an interval. It has a UID, which is this block reference here. Right, this is the block reference, and it has contents, which is the contents of this block, which is just hello right now. And uh, this is what we're using to compare. So every time it up, it, it um, the interval triggers, it compares the contents with the new contents, and then it issues any kind of changes, and it um, changes its contents. So we can look at uh, the, the shared DB. And we see we have 131 changes. And guess what the last change is? It is hello from Oslo, type instantiate, there are no external references, and this is the contents, right? So if I now add hi, and I can change this to hello one, let's see how it looks. So pubs, so I'm gonna make this a bit bigger. Uh, we see here that the contents is a list of blocks because we have two blocks here. We can see that we have 134 changes. We have hello from Oslo instantiate. We have a block creation. So we're creating a new block with a UID and an uh, order and so on. And we're changing this string to high and we're changing this string from hello to hello one. And you see here that the UIDs have been transformed from the normal UIDs to the DN research, right? And what happens if we subscribe? Again, here we actually have a bunch of, of uh, subscriptions already because I've been playing around with this, but I'm gonna create a new subscription uh, to hello from, what did I call it? Hello from Oslo. Yes, so let's subscribe to, and by the way, let's just check. So this is now a different database. Let's see what, and we see that the data here also has 134 changes because ShareDB is sitting in the background and is constantly updating. Right, so if I add a new subscription here, hello from Oslo, and I turn it on, what will happen? We get these two blocks, that's good. And we see here in the subs, we have a new subscription, hello from Oslo, has an interval, has an index, which is the last change that it has seen. And it has the UID, which is this UID, which is where it's gonna insert stuff. 
it's now. So now uh, I can of course edit here and you will see that this one is updating. I can also pull in a block reference to show you how that works. So let's, let me open my um, write up in the sidebar and I'm going to publish the technical walkthrough. So I'm going to say updating technical walkthrough and I can also just make that as a, as a reference like this. That's a lot. So let's see. There. We see here there's a reference, so it's being referenced in this conversation. And that didn't quite come through. It might be because I was editing it too much. Let's try that one more time. I'm just going to paste that reference there. And now it comes in. Let's change this to an embed. And here's the whole thing. Okay, so what, what happened right now? Well, we now have two public, we have several publications. So we have Hello from Oslo. Ah, so see here, I, because it's reading all the time, it caught these guys. But this is the one I want. So it is publishing now this bullet, this this bullet and all of the children, as we can see here, as a content, right? These are the children, they have children, they have children, maybe. Um, yeah, so it's, it's publishing all of this. And here, this thing now has um, external content. So if we look at changes we now have even more because we now have external refs so external refs is this one and we have this new publication right and going to the other database we see that it's now subscribing to also this, um, this new guy. Now, where is this guy? Where is this embed located? Well, we can go, go to, um, see. How do I go? So here we see it's it's an embed, it's this block. And if we go to Roam Inter Depot, we see here um, this bullet, right? And all of the contents below it. So that is the bullet and research slash tcdms that is the bullet that's being referenced here tcdms and we see here there's other stuff as well um, so these guys obviously are empty um, there's this bullet there's this bullet there's this bullet so here is just all the different bullets that i've i've ever published are on this page now the final thing i wanted to show is a conversation so let's get rid of this subscription Let's get rid of this publication. Let's start a conversation. So I want to start a conversation about Rome Inter. And to turn it on. Right, so what happened? Again, if we look at the pubs, we have Rome slash Inter and research so the name so we're publishing and this is this bullet right this is and here you see by by, by the way U, uid generated by cuid so if we go here and copy the block reference that's that block reference 
So we have a publication focused not on this bullet, but on this bullet. And it's the Rome slash Inter is the name of the publication. I'm sorry, the conversation. And then this is the stream from my database. And then we have convos. And here we see that we have a single conversation going on called Rome Inter. And this is the UID of this bullet. Okay, and so this stream works exactly the same as any other stream. So if I say, this is cool, and we look at changes, we'll see here, what the first thing that happens is we have a new change type called join conversation, and the name is DN Research. That is my database, and the name of the conversation is Rome Inter. Then we have a completely disconnected um, public thing here where we're subscribing to this stream. We're instantiating it with the block children and so on. And we're updating that stream. Uh, on the other side, what happens if we join this conversation? We see here, um, I get the text from this database. It inserts a new bullet for myself. I can edit it. I can edit it. Of course, block references work just fine. And the cool thing is block references also work internally. So I can say, I like this. Here you see, this has a crazy uh, UUID because of this being generated by me and it's prepended by STN research. And so here, if I look at it, you'll see it's the same UUID, but I took away the STN research. And this means that this backlink works in both databases, which is really neat. Um, and again, as you can guess, what just happened is that we first issued the joint conversation. So we have a Rome Inter joint convo, STN Diedia. Then we create a new publication, which is Rome Inter STN Diedia. We instantiate that. And then of course, we also subscribe to STN Research. So Rome Inter STN Research. So, so this is basically th three things. It's a top level conversation and it's listening for any new people joining and it will add a new bullet for those. It is publishing this stream and it's subscribing to this stream. Okay, so that was a lot of detail. I'm hoping you were able to mostly follow. Um, there are many, many different choices here that could be questioned. Um, I'm very open to rethinking this, but I think uh, going from this initial insight to implementing it, trying it out, um, has given me a lot of ideas for how this could be carried forwards. And I am hoping that we can turn this into something that can be actually widely usable. And I'm super excited to hear what you think. Thanks a lot.